And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Back in the day, way, way, way back in the day, when I was just a young boy, like a lot of young boys, I really liked superheroes. Now, we didn't have as many superheroes then as we do now. It was kind of limited, so mostly it was either Superman or Batman. I liked Superman okay, uh, but there were just some things about him that weren't attractive to me. Some of it was the fact that he could just be beaten, be beat, beaten in anything. He was so powerful and could do everything. What was the point? He was going to win every fight. He was never in danger unless a criminal got his hands on some kryptonite and threatened him that way. But for the most part, Superman was invulnerable to everything and won every fight, and it was kind of boring. Batman, on the other hand, because he was just a regular guy, albeit a rich playboy with a lot of fancy and expensive toys, but because he was just a regular guy, he got in trouble all the time. And there was something interesting to me in that, the fact that Batman faced danger on a regular basis. I was fascinated with that Batman television show that came out in the mid-1960s. I watched it religiously as a four- and five-year-old kid, wanting to see what would happen, rooting for Batman, and getting very nervous and scared when at the end of every episode, Batman got into one of his usual predicaments. There was always a cliffhanger in which Batman and Robin usually, their lives were threatened somehow. The bad guys pulled some trick, got them in trouble, and now their lives were in danger. And you were always left at the end of those shows wondering, is Batman going to make it or not? And I always rooted for him to make it and was always then pleasantly surprised to see him come through in the end and defeat justice and bring the villains to the police and save the day. It was a great show and it was a great feeling knowing that Batman was on your side. He was fighting for law and order. That's what we were rooting for, really. Law and order, for the good guys to defeat the bad guys. The forces of good, represented by justice and the police and what's right, to defeat the bad guys, the crooks, the criminals, those who were seeking to upset the order. I think deep down all of us root for law and order. All of us want the good guy to win and the bad guy to lose. The guy in the white hat to win the shootout at the end of the movie and defeat the guy in the black hat. In the end, no matter how much of a wild streak we have in us, we are all deep down believers in law and order. And it should come as no surprise that God is as well. That's where we get it from. That's where we get our concept of justice and law and order and fairness and rightness. All those issues of morality and what's right and what's wrong come from God. And he is the first and most important believer in law and order. God established his laws to help his people, not to hinder us, but to help us grow and develop in faith towards him. And when we disobeyed, when we walked away into sin and disobedience, law and order was upset. God's law 
and order. And God being the perfect lawgiver and the perfect judge and the perfect source of law cannot stand or abide sin and disobedience. In God's world of law and order, sin must be punished. It must. It cannot go unnoticed. It cannot go ignored. There are some places, many places, as a matter of fact, courtrooms, where someone will appear before a judge having committed a crime, but because it is a first offense and it is a relatively mild crime, that person gets off with a warning or a slap on the wrist. I'm sure almost all of us know someone, maybe even in our own family, maybe even ourselves, who have been pulled over for speeding, having violated the law, driven too fast, and yet were let off by the officer with a simple warning, don't do it again because we're good citizens and we have a clean record. It doesn't work that way in God's sense of law and order. All disobedience must be punished. All sinfulness must be punished. And the bigger problem we've got is God can't and will not let us off the hook because we're all guilty. We have all violated God's laws. We have all fallen short of the glory of God and all have sinned. That's why we know the wages of sin is death. Sin must be punished. In God's perfect system of law and order, all sin must be punished and accounted for. There are no warnings. There are no slaps on the wrist. God takes sin and law and order very seriously. But that's why Jesus is going to the cross during this Lenten season. That's why Jesus came, the incarnate word. That's why God sent his only son, to take that punishment for us, to fulfill the law that we cannot fulfill on our own. It is Jesus who fulfills the law, it is Jesus who takes the punishment we deserve, and therefore God's perfect system of law and order is balanced. It's not as though God is simply giving us a slap on the wrist in Jesus and simply saying, that's okay, it's a first offense, don't worry about it. It's that God is putting all of the punishment on his own son who takes all of it, past, present, and future, for all people. God's perfect system of law and order is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And that leaves us with a very stark choice. The most important choice you will ever make in your life of faith, in your spiritual journey. And that is this. How are you going to achieve your salvation? What road are you going to go down that leads to salvation? Are you going to take the road of the law or are you going to take the road of faith? Because only one road will get you where you want to go. The other is a dead end that leads nowhere except to condemnation. 
Let's start out by talking about that road of the law. And when I say we have a choice, we really do. We, in our faith lives, we have to choose, in a sense, how we're going to accept salvation, how we're going to achieve it. Do you think you can go down the road of the law and be saved? In other words, do you believe that you could adhere to the law, that you could follow God's commands, that you could do what he tells you to do, and therefore be justified in his sight? Do you believe that you can be good enough for salvation? Do you believe that you can do enough good things in your life? And sure, everybody makes mistakes and everybody sins and everybody backslides now and again, but do you believe that you do enough good things and you obey enough laws that you will satisfy God? It's not like God that I'm out murdering people, or rioting, or looting, or robbing banks. I do a lot of good things in my life. Do you believe it's enough? That's the road of the law. That's the road that the law leads down. And the problem is, if that's the road you're on, it leads only to failure and disappointment and death. Because the law cannot save you. Observing the law cannot save you. Because you would have to obey the law perfectly. You would have to obey all of God's laws and commands, which means you would never sin. That's the only way that road works. That's the only way that could achieve for you salvation, and it is impossible. That's why we read, in our reading from Romans, from verse 15, that the law brings only wrath. That's what it means. The law is there to show us our sin. The law is there to convict us of our sin. The law is there to show us how far we fall below God's expectations. It is not there to save us. It cannot save us because we cannot keep it. If you choose to go down that road, it will lead only to death and condemnation. The other alternative, of course, is faith. That's the contrast we see, in a sense, in both of our readings this morning. This contrast between the law and faith. The law shows us our need for salvation. It shows us our shortcomings. It convicts us of our sin. The point of the law is to bring us to faith. And faith in the one whom God sent, who fulfilled the law perfectly, for us. If you go to our Old Testament reading in Genesis and look at that very first verse, God is speaking to Abraham and laying out the covenant he's going to make with him. We talked about covenants last week, remember. And look at what he tells Abraham in that first verse, Genesis 17, 1. If you walk before me faithfully, and be blameless. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. How is it possible for us to be blameless? Because we're sinners. We sin every day in multiple ways. We violate and break God's law, whether thinking about it, doing it, talking about it. How, it, how is it that we can be blameless? By faith, by walking in faith. 
Because when we walk in faith and put our faith in Christ and not in ourselves and not in observing the law, that's what gives us the righteousness to stand before God. Not our righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ. We are blameless because we come to God not through the law, but through the faith. Faith in Christ. And even Abraham did that. There's always that interesting question. How did all those guys in the Old Testament get to heaven? Because there was no Jesus yet. Not a human Jesus anyway, right? How did they get to heaven? They couldn't fulfill the law, right? What they had faith in was the same Jesus that we look back on, they were looking forward to. They had faith in God's promise of a Savior. They had faith in a Jesus they couldn't yet see. And that's what saved them. Not anything they did, but their faith in God and in his promises. In that reading from Genesis, we're told that Abraham had faith against all hope. God told him his wife would bear him a son. He was 100 years old. Sarah was 90. And yet Abraham believed him, and it was credited to him as righteousness because of his faith in the promise of God. He had faith in a Christ that would not be born for thousands of years. And that is where our righteousness comes from as well. Now at this point, some of you may may be thinking, Pastor Brad, this is all stuff we've heard a thousand times. We can't save ourselves. We can't get to heaven observing the law. It's all based on faith in Jesus. I know you know it, or you should know it, because all the time I hear from people, many of them from this congregation, oh, I hope I'm good enough to get to heaven. I hope I've done enough good things. I hope I deserve to get there. Those are all ideas and thoughts from people who are trying to go down the wrong road. Those are all ideas that people have when they're on the road of the law. Give up those ideas. Get off that road. You can't be good enough. You don't deserve to go to heaven. No one does. No one is good enough. The only way any of us ever get there is because of the faith we have in Jesus, coming to him on our knees, giving him our lives, confessing our sins to him, and saying to him, I am a sinner, and I deserve only God's condemnation and wrath, but I come seeking his grace and mercy in the blood of Jesus. That's the only road that leads to salvation. That is the only way it works Do not be confused. Do not be misled. You cannot do enough good things. You cannot be good enough. I don't care how many good deeds you have. The only road that leads to salvation is the road that runs through Jesus. I... uh, stopped paying attention to superheroes a long time ago. Especially the newer versions of Batman they have out. Some of the newer Batman movies, Batman is more conflicted. He's not someone who's so much law and order, but he cuts corners. He breaks laws. He gets beat up quite a lot by the bad guys. And that's not a Batman I want to believe in. 
I want to believe in that 1960s Batman. The guy that worked with the police, that brought in the bad guys, that risked his life to protect law and order. It's that same law and order we're talking about. God is a God of law and order. The law we know well about. It is a law that God has given to us that as try as we might, as hard as we try, as much as we want, we cannot keep it. We are the bad guys. We are the ones in the black hats because of disobedience. That's the law. The order comes through Jesus Christ. The order comes in what he has reestablished by going to the cross, sacrificing his body and blood, taking the punishment upon himself that we deserved. That brings order. And more importantly, it brings salvation. From Romans 4, 13, we must always remember that that salvation is accomplished, accomplished for us, not by law, but by faith. Amen.